A large study on masks details their importance in the fight against COVID. Bullshit. For an in-depth look, we spoke to one of the lead authors of that study. Researchers at Stanford, Yale, and UC Berkeley analyzed 350,000 adults in Bangladesh. Now, they took half of that group and encouraged them to wear masks. 29% of them uh, complied with that for about a 10-week period. They found that masks in general provided a 9% reduction in cases. Yeah, junk science. And today on Skeptico, our guest, Dr. Andy Paquette, will break down what is one of the most deceptive studies I've run across. I mean, this discussion even brought us back to the Sheldrick Wiseman days. But let's roll on with the clip. Surgical masks were even more efficient, reducing cases by 11%. Uh, Ashley Stusinski, one of the lead authors in the study and an infectious disease fellow at Stanford, says the results offer a glimpse of just how much masks matter. So overall, we felt that this demonstrated that masks are highly effective in reducing COVID-19. Yeah, Alex, I got to say like a couple things. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is just yeah. first off. The first headline was much more sensational than the second one. Both of them are not based on any kind of foundation of evidence found in this article. But the thing that really got me was that clip of the uh, the TV news. So the TV announcer says that they found a 9% reduction in cases. And then the lady says, yes, it's 9% up to 11% for this other condition. And I'm thinking, I just read that paper and what they just said is wrong. It's a 9% relative reduction. The actual absolute reduction was something like 0.002%. It was tiny. The headline to me is big lie. And when I say big lie, I mean, it's kind of well known in propaganda is the best way to hide a lie is to make it a big lie because little lies are liable to be exposed. If they would have just tried to bury this study and not put it out and someone stumbled across it and said, hey, here's another no result. Stack it alongside the, the Danish study that just came out, randomized control study that shows no result. Stack it along with all the epidemiological data, which we should talk about. I think what they've done is they've hyped it up in order to bury it. So the debate becomes, well, you know, did they really do it? You know, did they do this right? Who did they force to do it? When what the real story is, another no result. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and today we welcome back Dr. Andrew Paquette to Skeptico. Andy is probably best known, at least to Skeptico listeners, for his work in cataloging and analyzing just an amazing collection of dreams. And we talked to Andy way back in the day when this book, Dreamer, 20 Years of Psychic Dreams and How They Changed My Life, when that book came out, and I have stayed in contact with Andy. He's really become a friend of mine and a friend of the shows. He's also, I should mention, as you might have seen from the website of his that I pulled up there, he is just an incredible artist and somewhat well known. He's also a professional photographer, has done work in major publications, major media publications, maybe he'll mention them that anyone would know. He's also a graphic artist. And he a couple years ago, he got his PhD from King's College London on something called spatial visualization among digital artists, which I don't know what that means. But now that I've laid out Andy's amazing background, I want to tell you, we are probably not going to talk about much of any of that today. Because Andy is this renaissance man of bio that covers all these different things. But one of the things I always think of Andy and the reason he's kind of my go-to guy for this particular show is he is a scientist. I mean, he's published in peer reviewed journals, particularly he's published in the journal of scientific exploration a couple times, but he's also published in other peer reviewed journals. But I, the one that always pops to my mind is the Journal of Scientific Exploration, because I know the standards there. I know how tough it is because it is its roots are as a parapsychology journal and parapsychologists have been so picked on over the years that they're extra careful about how they do their work. And Andy has been extra careful about that. And I know over the years, as he shared some of his 
papers with me, I've seen how he sweated over the details of getting the statistics right. And in a minute, as we get on with this interview, maybe he'll even tell you about when he kind of leaned on Dr. Daryl Bem, very famous professor from Cornell, who's also well published in this field and how Andy collaborated with him as scientists do to get their science right, to get their statistics right. So all that is just a background for why I felt Andy was a perfect, perfect fit as a go-to guy to analyze this very, very interesting study that we're going to look at today. But before we get into it, and we will get into it really quickly, Andy, welcome. Welcome back. And thanks for joining me. What else did I leave out of that intro bio there that you'd like to add? Well, you you did leave out the writing I've been doing lately, because I on a call I was making, I guess it was about a year ago, uh, relating to a photo shoot, I wound up instead talking myself into a job as a staff writer, uh, writing articles about current events. And that was for an online publication called Law Enforcement Today. And then I've been doing that more recently for Red Voice Media, where I've just become a regular columnist. So, and the, as far as the number of articles at the Journal of Scientific Exploration, I believe it's five that they've published, one for the International Journal, Journal of Dream Research, and another one, one that I did in a journal on education research. My, my research for my PhD was about the development of professional levels of competence, and then I used computer graphics artists as, as, as a group that I was going to study to, to find that. But the overall goal was just to look at how competence or proficiency or even uh, expertise is achieved primarily because I wanted to contest the idea that you actually have to like study something hard for 10 years in order to gain expertise. My impression was if you found the key concepts that defined expertise and you did it quickly, you would be an expert even if it took you 30 days. And I was able to show that. There's probably a few other things I left out, but it's good enough. Mentioned that I worked on Spider-Man the movie or Daredevil or Space Jam. You didn't mention the games I worked on like Unreal and uh, Parasite Eve or Full Spectrum Warrior. Those are all big titles too. Anyway, you can go on. Or my TV show, forgot about that. I did a comic book that became a TV series called Harsh Realm. It was awful, don't worry about it. But still, it's a, it's a TV show. Not many people get those. So interesting background. And again, you have this kind of amazing graphic artist background. And there's all sorts of interesting skeptical like stories about that, that we've connected on over the years. But what I'm really trying to punch up and tell me if I'm doing it too much is I think you understand how to analyze this mask study that was done on the impact of community masking in COVID-19. This is a study from Yale and Stanford. It made somewhat of a splash in the media because they found, God darn it, just put on those masks like we told you. Here's the best science. Here's the science you've been clamoring about, waiting for. Here it is, nail in the coffin research. So let me start with this, Andy. When did you first hear about this study? I know I sent it to you. Had you heard about it before then? Uh, no, I hadn't. I, the first time I knew about it was from you. I thought it might have been me who kind of turned you on to this, because as you know, I've been on this mask thing for a while. And that when I say the mask thing, this idea of whether or not masks are really effective in controlling the spread of COVID among the general population. So we might get into that in a minute and we have to differentiate between whether they work in a lab to whether they work out in the general population. But I've kind of really gone out there and I've hammered a number of guests on the show and even had a debate on the show saying that masks don't work, that you always get a null result whenever these studies are done. And then somebody on the skeptical forum pointed me to this, what is published here in live science and the title reads huge gold standard study shows unequivocally that surgical masks work to reduce covid spread so i started looking into that i found a similar article on the washington post i'll read in that headline which is also sensational 
massive randomized study is proof that surgical masks limit coronavirus spread, authors say. And one other thing I want to share with folks is how it played out in the in the news, news being kind of in quotes here, but I wanted to play this, how it was processed by mainstream media news. A large study on masks details their importance in the fight against COVID. For an in-depth look, we spoke to one of the lead authors of that study. Researchers at Stanford, Yale, and UC Berkeley analyzed 350,000 adults in Bangladesh. Now, they took half of that group and encouraged them to wear masks. 29% of them compiled, uh, complied with that for about a 10-week period. They found that masks in general provided a 9% reduction in cases. Surgical masks were even more efficient, reducing cases by 11%. Uh, Ashley Stusinski, one of the lead authors in the study and an infectious disease fellow at Stanford, says the results offer a glimpse of just how much masks matter. So overall, we felt that this demonstrated that masks are highly effective in reducing COVID-19. And that if we were able to achieve even more uptake than the 29 percentage point increase we saw, we would have probably been able to measure a greater effect. The study found people 60 and older. They I'm going to pause it there. Were you able to hear all that? Yeah, Alex, I got to say like a couple of things. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is just yeah. first off. The first headline was much more sensational than the second one. Both of them are not based on any kind of foundation of evidence found in this article. But the thing that really got me was that clip of the uh, the TV news. So the TV announcer says that they found a 9% reduction in cases. And then the lady says, yes, it's 9% up to 11% for this other condition. And I'm thinking, I just read that paper and what they just said is wrong. It's a 9% relative reduction. The actual absolute reduction was something like 0.002%. It was tiny. So for them to call that a 9% or an 11% uh, um, value extrapolated from a 9 to 11% relative value when you're comparing two numbers that are almost identical is really disingenuous. Now, maybe they're just stupid. I suppose that's possible. They are after no, all. No, 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 no. Don't, don't go there with that second part. I, I, I want okay. to roll this back a little bit because I, I, I've just kind of played in the, the first impact because as I tell the story, you know, I've been hammering the mask stuff forever because I looked at I looked at the existing data and the existing data always had a null result. Whenever you took it out and tested it in the general population, no result, no result. Just recently, the, there was a Danish study published, same thing, no result. When we actually try and apply masking to people in the general population, there's no difference. It doesn't make a difference if you wear a mask, it's not effective, no result, no result. That to me seemed to be the overriding data. So yeah. when I first heard this report, when it was published, on the skeptical forum, which is the first time I did. And I found that article on live science. I gotta tell you, cause I think this is wh where it hits people. My heart dropped and, and my heart dropped. Cause like, oh my God, I'm an idiot. I'm, I've been wrong and I've been spreading this stupid information. And here are these really smart people at Yale and at Stanford and they're doing it, they're, they're way smarter than me about this stuff. And they're so confident, nail in the coffin level of research, gold standard study. These are not my words. Highest quality, gold standard type of clinical trial known as randomized control trial should end any scientific debate. So says Jason Alla, Alla Luck, an economist at Yale. and. I, I want to get into this, but I have to say, as, as this first hit me and my kind of, like I say, my heart dropped, there were also a couple of things that immediately jumped out at me. And I want you to, because we talked about this, and I want you to talk about it as well. When I, when I heard such over-the-top language as should end any scientific debate, it did cast an immediate doubt in my mind, like, hey, maybe there's something here that we need to look into. What did you think when you read that kind of stuff? Did it... Look, there's there's a couple of things, like, for instance, the, the comment about ending scientific debate. That one acknowledges that there is a scientific debate, which is 
in opposition to all the rest of the media signaling, which is telling us that there is no scientific debate because everyone agrees about this stuff, because science says masks are good. So the mere fact that they're actually saying this is the nail in the coffin of that argument is telling me there is an argument. Why You are now admitting this here, which is something that you're denying beforehand. So, and, and when you use extravagant language like nail in the coffin, you know, or, or examples like that, it also makes me highly suspicious. I mean, my, my tendency when I'm reading that kind of language or hyperbole is to not trust it. it. I'm like immediately suspicious that what they're saying is the opposite of what I'm going to find when I look at whatever it is that they're talking about, um, because that tends to be the case. For a pre-published paper on top of it, right? Well, the fact that it's pre-published really bothers me. Uh, I, I don't know what would persuade a, a real proper scientist to send out a document before it's been peer reviewed and, and to tout it as something that's a pre-publication version of something that the, they intend to put through peer review. To me, that, that one reason you might do that, I suppose, is if you're worried that it won't pass peer review and so you want to uh, get a step ahead of that by, by getting some popular support for it among people who actually don't know enough to understand the mistakes that you've made. Again, this is the direction my thinking takes when I, when I see this. But frankly, I think it's really bad manners to do it. But on top of that, I also think it's bad science because the thing is the peer review process is helpful to the authors. It's very helpful. I wouldn't want to present something that hadn't been peer reviewed for a number of reasons. But one of them is... I rather appreciate the help I get from the people who peer review my articles. They don't just uh, put a stamp of approval on these things and then, and then send them in for publication. They make comments that are genuinely useful. I, I get those comments. I'm like, oh, gee, I really should clarify this point or I should correct this number. And once I've done that, I feel a lot more confident in the paper. So if I do it before I've ever shown it to anybody for peer review, I'm thinking, you know, what? I have less confidence in my own work right now because it hasn't been vetted by anyone else. So why is it that these guys are doing it? Well, that's a really good point. So, you know, there's a number of ways we could tackle this study. You have a number of points that you've piled up. I do too, but I don't wanna bury the lead. And I think the lead here is that when you analyze the numbers, this study actually proves the exact opposite of what it claims because this study is confirmation of the null hypothesis. That is that there's no evidence that masks work when you move them into the general population. And that's kind of my working hypothesis, which we'll kind of hash out later, is that I think the hype on this study is kind of the head fake, because if you really work out all the numbers and you say, wow, this is, they did do a huge study. But the fact is, they got a null result. And that's a replication, in a sense, yeah. of all the other null results. And the last thing you want is for that to get out. So the best way to go out there is lead out with a big lie that, oh my God, this is the best study ever. Andy, I think you had a, a comment. I've pulled the numbers that I want to talk about up on the screen. But what did you want to say before we dive into this? What I want to say is that the way the study is written is deceptive on its face. It's really clear that they're intentionally disguising the actual findings of the study and the meaning of it. They are not making any comparisons to studies that come to different conclusions. Like for instance, the many studies you're talking about that show that mask wearing has no positive benefit. And I know about those studies and I've seen them. So why they are left out of this makes no sense to me because they would, if they have this robust result, you would expect them to say, look at this, all these studies, X, Y, and Z show or claim that um, masks aren't effective, but we have proven them wrong. And this is how we've proven them wrong. Nowhere do they address this. And that should have been right up front. And it, I, it's nowhere. I, I am really disappointed by that. But then when it comes to the numbers, and you keep talking about this huge study, they got around 350,000 people in the study. But when I look at the actual number of people who are relevant to their conclusions, it's a small number in, uh, relative to these bigger numbers that they're throwing around. And every single opportunity, they use the bigger numbers whenever they can, even though they're not directly relevant to what they're talking about. So that also bothers me. Anyway, go on. No, everything you're saying is great. So what I want to do next for people who are listening and aren't watching this, 
I'm referencing now right out of the study. You can get this link right from the Washington Post. And by the way, you can also get a whole hashing out of this that we did on the Skeptical Forum. I kind of put up this post saying, hey, help me out with this upcoming interview. And it was really great. I got a lot of posts. Not a lot of them I agreed with, but definitely it, it helped the whole process because it's hard to figure this stuff out. Everyone makes mistakes here or there, just like we're going to point out that the scientists in this case made some mistakes. But the, the numbers can get a little bit confusing. But what I wanted to point out here is figure one is right out of the study. And this is the headline, big graphic. So again, they had about 340,000 people. They had 146,000 in the control group, and they had about 160,000 in the intervention group. Intervention group are people that they went and they pestered the crap out of them to wear this mask for the 10 weeks. And here is the result that they got. Check this out, people. In the control group, at the end of the day, and we'll tell you how they got to this, but they figure out that 0.76% of their control group had COVID. The group that they pestered the heck out of, that group had a COVID rate of 0.69%. And they said, like Andy just pointed out, hey, guys, let's get all excited. That's a relative 9.3 reduction in COVID. Multiply that by all the people in the world. Multiply that by all the weeks in the year. Multiply that if we got people to double their mask rate, all of which you can't do is total bullshit science. But nonetheless, the, the real fatal flaw, the real junk science part of this is in the numbers themselves. Here's the little story I wanted to share with people, Andy, and then I want you to really take over on this. Here's another way to think of this study. Let's say I had a magic pendant a little magic pendant with a crystal and a little leather strap on it. And I said, Andy, if you wear this magic pendant, you won't get COVID. And then I did my big study and I came out and I proved it, guys. I proved it. And you came back and say, okay, well, tell me, tell me how you proved it. And I said, well, we took a thousand people. And you know how many of them had COVID at the end of it? Eight. Now I'm saying eight because that 0.76% rounded up because it's 7.6 people, we're rounded up to eight. And I'll say eight people had COVID. And then you go, okay, well, how many people in your intervention group, the people who actually wore the pendant? So then, Andy, if you were to say, well, how many people that actually wore the pendant got COVID? And I'd say, oh yeah, seven. Seven out of a thousand who wore the pendant got COVID. And you'd go, Wait a minute, you said the control group, eight out of a thousand had COVID and in the intervention, the people who wear their magic pendant, only seven out of a thousand had COVID? You'd go, that's not a very convincing result. And especially if you pressed me and said, well, how did you even measure whether they were wearing the pendant or not? How did you measure whether they had COVID at the end? What kind of test did you do? Is it possible that you made any mistake in terms of testing those thousand people? All those things would cast doubt on how accurate it was, particularly when my end result is that this is the effect. The effect is a reduction from 0.76% to 0.69%. It is minuscule. Anyone with common sense would tell you that is not a significant difference just because you wore the magic pendant. Uh, maybe that's a stupid example, but that's what really brought it home to me is how they're totally playing with these numbers in order to create the illusion that they've done something when in fact they've really done the opposite. They've confirmed that this is a null result. What do you think, Andy? Well, yeah, and I'm sitting here thinking uh, you're taking all my thunder here. Uh, because all the stuff you say is right. I look at that and frankly, I think it's extremely dishonest for them to call that a 9.3% relative reduction. In a, in a scientific paper that's going into a scientific journal, you would say what the reduction is, not the relative reduction. And, rel and you know, if you wanted to make that a 99% relative reduction, you could do that, just reduce those numbers enough, you know, like 0.001 to 0 0.00001. And you could have this incredible relative reduction, and it'd be totally meaningless because the numbers are so small, just as in this case. And in this, and also because of the number of people involved, it's uh, you actually could do that. So when I look at the paper, I'm seeing 
two things that bother me. I mean, you're, you're focusing on the number, and I think you should, because it is an important uh, defect. But the other thing is the way they report it is very dishonest. I would say it's manifestly dishonest, meaningfully dishonest. They've changed the meaning of what they did, how they did it, and what it means. All of those things are, are reasons to not approve this for publication. If I was reviewing this paper for a journal, I would not want to approve it just on that basis alone. Even, even that one line that you just showed there, that image, the graphic where it says relative reduction, right there, that word relative, they take that out and replace it with the absolute reduction or it doesn't get published. But this, this uh, article is full of stuff like that throughout from, from front to, to back. The fact that they, they don't bother mentioning uh, competing theories. That's a big problem for me. I don't like how they, um, I, I forget where it is, but there's a, one of these places where they, they drastically increase the numbers that are affected by this, provided their conjecture is true, but that's provided their conjecture is true, which is not something I'm willing to grant is the case, and they give no justification for it. Um, you know what I'm talking about. They have a number 2.5 in there where they, they essentially multiply their results by 2.5 and say, this is what the results would be if this fancy pants invented uh, uh, theory of ours is correct. And I'm like, well, prove that first and then give me the, the 2.5 because otherwise well, well, it doesn't the, make It's interesting because where the 2.5 comes from, if we are going to talk a little bit about the, the method that they use, the protocols, what they did is they, they took this huge population in Bangladesh, which I have to say, once once I got over the point of saying, this is all concocted, it's junk science, and it's intentionally junk science, you start questioning the whole thing. One, why do you need 340,000 people? I suspect that one of the reasons you need 340,000 people is what you just alluded to. And I want you to talk more about that from your experience, is when you have a really large population, it's kind of easier to fudge the stats at the end of the day. I mean, if you had one tenth of this, if you had 40,000 people, you'd still have a very significant study and you'd have a much more manageable study, right? Okay, the, the thing that bugs me about this is that I'm not even convinced that there, that 340,000 number refers to genuine participants in the sense that they are relevant to the claims that they're making here. Yes, they had 340,000 people fill out a survey, but they did not give 340,000 people blood tests to determine whether or not they had this um, the COVID uh, virus in them, okay? They only had something less than 10,000, 9,000 something uh, of those people had that. So what they're doing is they're testing for seroprevalence and their their whole conclusion is based on changes in the, the amount of seroprevalence in one group versus another. And they're saying it applies to 340,000 people, but they only gave the test to 9,000 something. If you read this study, they had to, to go to great lengths to explain how they created this randomized group versus the control group. And they really want to hype that up because that they did and they probably did right. And, you know, how do you get the profile of a village that matches up and all the rest of this? All smokescreen, smokescreen. Because as you said, what they do at the end of the day is then they go and they pester the crap out of these people. They show them videos of their sports heroes in Bangladesh and politicians in Bangladesh saying, wear the mask, wear the mask. And then they go out and they have their, their little observers who they pay to go and observe people in the market, whether they're wearing the mask. They haven't, then they say, well, we should observe them in the mosque too, you know, because mask wearing, we already know that if, if masks are effective at all, they're effective where the, where the virus is being spread, not outdoors in the market, right? But leave all yeah. that aside. Again, it, it, just, it just is a smokescreen. Here's what I wanted to get to. At the end of the day, what they do is they say, okay, time to tally up the results. Let's see who has COVID. So th this is not an unreasonable way to do it. It just has the high possibility of introducing air. And that is that they call everybody up and they say, hey, that's 10 weeks. Remember you were doing this study. How are you feeling? You got COVID, you got a flu, got a cough, they go through the symptoms. And the person goes, <laughs> yeah, I don't feel good today. They say, come on in for a blood test, would you? 40%, both the control is pretty much the same, both in the control group and in the intervention group, the people that they're bugging to wear the mask, 40% of them come in. That's where they get the 2.5, right? Because 40% multiply it 2.5, you'd get 100%. But that's fake, you can't do that. All you know is that 40% of the people you called came in. 
You don't yeah, know which 40%. You don't, you don't, this is a telemarketing thing. You don't yeah, know well, if I, you have somebody calling them up who's really good at talking people. It has the kind of motherly vibe and it says, oh, honey, you sound really bad now. You should come in. And they get more people to come in than the other one. There's all sorts of potential for human error. Because remember, at the end of the day, you got a difference of one out of a thousand is the difference. If you lose a blood sample, if you get the wrong person to come in, if any of that changes, you have a, a complete null result. You don't even have this kind of fake null result that barely jumps over some bar. I know you're dying to jump in here. Please do. Oh, I absolutely am. But I wanted to get back to this two and a half times because and I'm going to read it right off the article. Their justification is, quote, if non-consenters have similar seroprevalence to consenters, and I'm thinking that is a completely unjustifiable assumption or even conjecture. And the reason, apart from the, the reasons you gave, which I think are also valid, it seems to me that the non-consenting group is going to be meaningfully different from the consenting group. Otherwise, they would have consented. Therefore, I wouldn't want to make any assumptions about them being similar to a group that they have just proven they're dissimilar from. That doesn't make any sense to me. Especially when you keep tying it back to the numbers. And that's what I think. It took me a long time to work through this study and think about it and mull it over. But I think it's such a, a great window into the whole pandemic thing and how the whether this is a program or not is really the question we're trying to we've been trying to answer all along with COVID. And I yeah. think the masks are an interesting window into that question. And, and I think this study in particular kind of shows the method. So I totally agree with what you're saying, but I would just bring it back to one out of a thousand was your difference. So when you talk about the potential for a mistake being made and what you just said, remember the magnitude of the mistake you need. One out of a thousand is their complete extent of the difference that they report. They also report that, hey, some of the blood samples we did, you know, they, they didn't work, you know, they didn't have the right blood or the, the label, the barcode label on it got messed up. They admit, you know, which is understandable that this yeah. thing wasn't perfect. Tie it back though, folks, one out of a thousand is the difference. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. But, you know, one other thing, too, that I want to I want to get at, and I know you want to stick with actually I'll stick with the numbers just for now. But you were talking about significance levels, that 0 0.042 number, something like that. Um, I just want to illustrate what that means. A 0 0.05 level of significance, number one, is not considered valid in a lot of situations, depending on what it is you're testing. But what it amounts to is a one in 20 chance that it's random. OK, that's what it means. So 0 0.04, not much different from that. That's like a one in 21 chance, something like that, that this is happening randomly, okay? And quite frankly, that's a high chance that it's happening randomly when you're looking at 340,000 people, okay? I would want a much different value with a population size that large um, if they're gonna claim significance. And then when they're claiming relative significance, this is like saying, I am relatively taller than my daughter in comparison to a Tyrannosaurus Rex and an elephant, okay? We're already very close just because we're the same species. This is something, you know, you want to know absolutely is this actually changing the, the effect, and it's not. And on, on top of everything else, on top of the fact that I think they're dishonestly reporting the results, I think their research objectives are dishonest also because they're saying we want to check out what kind of uh, methods are available to encourage people to wear masks, which they assume is the good thing to do. And they, they start talking about the kind of methods, you know, we're going to get people in mosques to ask the people to do it. We'll pay off their village elders, the equivalent of 6,000 US dollars if, if they get their people to up to a certain level of mask wearing, et cetera. Or the alternative, they say law enforcement. And I'm thinking, okay, so you're basically telling these guys and you're really pushing hard on this message, wear them or we'll force you to wear them, okay? So do it nicely or maybe we'll punch you in the face first and stick it on you while you're unconscious. That's kind of how I'm reading this because they were really pushing these guys hard. And quite frankly, that destroys any kind of neutral, neutral uh, viewpoint that these guys might have pretended to have had when they did this. They were, they were really coercing the subjects a lot. And that, as far as I'm concerned, is a highly unnatural condition that they cannot extrapolate to a general population. Just my impression.
Well, they do even worse than extrapolated at one point as we played in the video. They said, well, what if we could double it? We got an increase of 35% mask wearing. What if we get to get 75%? We would get even a higher rate, which again is a complete, that your data doesn't show any of that. But to your point, there's all these problems that come up both in enforcing the mask wearing, counting the mask wearing and all the rest of that. But I just am gonna keep bringing it back to the numbers because the headline to me is big lie. And when I say big lie, I mean, it's kind of well known in propaganda is the best way to hide a lie is to make it a big lie because little lies are liable to be exposed. If they would have just tried to bury this study and not put it out and someone stumbled across it and said, hey, here's another no result. Stack it alongside the, the Danish study that just came out, randomized control study that shows no result. Stack it along with all the epidemiological data, which we should talk about, right? Because we have, we've kind of amassed a lot of data on mask wearing. One, we go into a state and one county enforces it and the other county does it. And we look at the results at the end and there's no difference. We go from state to state, they do it, and there's no difference. And that's difficult to compare. It has all kinds of problems. That's why we would really would want a randomized control trial where they really do kind of control that. But we can't totally ignore that epidemiological data. But here what we have is confirmation further confirmation that mask wearing doesn't work in the general population. I think what they've done is they've hyped it up in order to bury it. So the debate becomes, well, you know, did they really do it? You know, did they do this right? Who did they force to do it? When what the, really, the, the real story is, another null result, more data that it, that it doesn't work. What do you think of the big lie theory? Oh, I think it's absolutely right. And actually, it reminds me of something the CDC did in a study of uh, pregnant women taking the vaccine, because what they did there, and I'm, I'm just doing this from memory, so I'm not going to give approximate numbers, but they did a study of about 900 pregnant women. I believe it was slightly more than that, but it was less than 1,000. And they said their results in their conclusions showed that the uh, risk to pregnant women of taking the vaccine was uh, in line with the normal risk of just being pregnant and having a miscarriage. Um, and that was based on 900 women with a 12% miscarriage rate, which they considered normal. Personally, I think that's shockingly, shockingly high. I had no idea that 12% would be considered uh, normal. But let's assume that they're telling the truth there and it really is considered normal. What they leave out is in the very same article, just like this one, they've got some numbers that disagree with what they just said, but they don't highlight it. So if you don't pay attention, you don't see it. So within that group of 900 women, they've got it broken down into trimesters and numbers of weeks that they're pregnant, right? So if you look at the women who were uh, 20 weeks pregnant, 82% of them had miscarriages. If you look at the women who were 16 weeks pregnant or less, it was 92% miscarriages okay those are extremely high rates but by blending those values in with the remaining women in that study who did not have miscarriages like basically everybody over 20 weeks and they get to say it's only a 12 percent rate and everybody's safe but what their data is actually saying is if you're in your first 20 weeks you are in a very high risk group and it is not safe for you if you're in your last 20 weeks nope first it's the, it's the women who are in the first 20 weeks who are most at risk of losing their baby, not last. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. So the thing is, it's not just simply disingenuous. This isn't a simple error. This is something that um, they had to know because the numbers are sitting right there. By covering it up the way they did, by masking it in their conclusions and discussion, they were able to get out the message to pregnant women, no matter how far along they were, that this is safe and you should go ahead and get the vaccine. That message can lead to them getting having miscarriages. And I think this is something that is highly unethical on the part of the CDC. I'm shocked that they did it. And I'm shocked that they got away with it, actually. I'm really amazed that the media let them get away with it because the information's just sitting right there. And what that means to me is either the media is absolutely lazy as all get out and they, they just don't know how to read or something, so they don't bother looking, or they're complicit in this. And I, I actually think it's more likely a combination of the two. I think they they will accept the top line reading of an article that they're told by their producers to read. But I also think that um, that they seem to want to promote this stuff because that's what they're actually doing. 
it's really shocking to see this. And it's it's widespread. I just wrote an article about this just a couple of days ago called Laundering Lies uh, for Red Voice Media. And it's all about how um, people are lying to more or less honest people, who, but they're doing it in such a convincing way. These honest people believe the lie and then spread it widely to other people who readily accept it because the people who are talking to them that are known to be honest people and they honestly believe the thing. So they're taking a lie from corrupt individuals who are doing it on purpose and passing it off into the hands of other people who are basically cleaning it because they themselves are honest and innocent in all this. And they become victims because then what happens is they act on these lies, they change their habits, they change their social relationships and so, and so on. And it's destructive to people around them and it's destructive to themselves. So for instance, if you're lying about whether or not masks are efficacious and you're telling people to wear these and they're always useful and everyone should do it, um, but in fact, they're either useless or they have a harmful effect, then what you're doing is you're promoting something that has a consequence that's the exact opposite of what your intentions are. And you're doing it because you've been persuaded to do it by people who have ill intentions. That's how it looks to me anyway. Wow, that's a stunning example. You'll have to send me that and I'll see if I can incorporate it into this, uh, into the video part of this and I'll provide I'll the link right for people who do it. And I, I stumbled across a, a lie, not of that proportion, but I think it fits in beautifully with what you're just saying. And it was that this is what one of the scientists in the study, one of the Yale guys, Ahmed Mubarak, I'm not totally sure on that name, but hey, I invited him on Skeptico. I invited, I should point out, remind me, I invited all these people on Skeptico. I invited Jason, I invited Ashley multiple times to come on Skeptico. I did get one response from Jason saying, after I pestered him a bunch of times, saying, oh, I'm too busy, I can't do it now. Which speaks back to your point, no scientific debate on this. So it's not just little old me that they're blowing off. They're not they're not engaging in any dialogue on this. They're, if they can go on and do kind of press release readings on the media, they'll do that, but no engagement with, with any of this stuff. But here's the quote from Ahmed. This is so next level creepy. I want to process it a little bit because it gets to this bigger issue. Here's what he wrote in, I think this is in the Washington Post, but you can find it. We'll have the exact quote in there. He says, most importantly, as soon as the data began to suggest that masking had benefits months before we drafted and released our study, we began to talk to the World Health Organization, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the World Bank and dozens of other governmental and non-governmental groups about scaling up so others would benefit. Here's the real beauty of this lie. Remember, one in a thousand was the difference. This is clearly a lie. There's no way the data came in. If you actually run the numbers, they wound up with slightly more COVID cases in their intervention group than in their control group because their population sizes were a little bit off and they had to adjust it. But at no time, at no time could have Ahmed observed any kind of significant surge in mask effectiveness because it was never, ever, ever there. And we know that because that's what the results say. So how can this be anything other than a complete lie? Yeah, well, actually, I want to say something about what you just said, because I think that population size difference is important because they mention that in the article. They say, you know, this is the population size of the one group, this is the population size of the other group, and then they say, but the difference is negligible, so we can basically ignore that. But then when they get to this incredibly tiny result that they have, that's they, they're going to magnify by turning it into a relative measurement and making it seem like it's much bigger than it is. So I'm thinking, you know, if you can just discard thousands of people extra in one group over the other, you should be doing giving the other uh, uh, number the same treatment, basically, and saying, you know what, this is too small to really worry about. That's a great point, because folks, if you want to go in there and dig into the numbers and work the numbers backwards, because they're kind of very sketch on the numbers, too. They don't always add up, but for the most part, they do add up. And what they do give you in the study 
is the total number of tests that they did, COVID tests, control group, intervention group, and they give you the percentage of people who tested positive. And from that, they don't give you the actual numbers. They never give you the case numbers, the number of cases, because the number of cases would just startle you. It'd be this one in a thousand. You'd go, one in a thousand? What are you guys talking about? This could not possibly be significant. But they bury it there. But if you work backwards to support your point, Andy, again, work those numbers backwards and there's actually more COVID cases in the intervention group. That is people who wore masks. They actually counted more COVID cases in that group than they did in their control group, people who didn't wear masks. Now, the, as you just said, they can kind of say, well, there's a little bit of a population size there, so we'll adjust it. And then you can get this very tiny, tiny little difference that they pump up, but fake, fake, fake junk science all the way. And I would suggest exactly. big lie. Yeah, well, one thing about that that's important too is that the difference in population size between the two groups is greater than the percentage difference between the two numbers that they extract their 9.3 relative uh, improvement number from, okay? So that also is important because if they're ignoring, let's just say 1% over here, they need to ignore everything under 1% over there because they're connected, okay? Um, and I'll tell you, when I was doing uh, my study on death dreams with all this help from Daryl Bem, which I really appreciated, you know, I, I found things that didn't really match my hypothesis very well, but it didn't make me dishonest about it. It didn't make me just discard them from the, from the pile and not report them or to report them differently. From I just reported them exactly as they were. It's like, this one is an outlier, okay? You know, I've got all these other examples here, and, and this is the result I get when I, when I run my test. And these guys are, are different. We can talk about that separately, but I'm not going to leave them out. And I am going to draw attention to it. That's the thing. When you have something like that that deviates from everything else, you have to mention it. Otherwise, you're not honestly reporting your results. These guys don't mention that stuff. They ignore it. They just, they just gloss over it all over the place. You know, if I'd gotten this from... Um, from a student, I, I, you know, I taught a master's uh, research uh, writing class when I was uh, teaching at university in the Netherlands. If I'd gotten this from students, initially, I'd be thinking, wow, you got a 96 page paper here, or 92, whatever it is. And uh, that's impressive. And you go, oh, you got 340,000 participants. That's impressive, right? I'd look at it. But then I'd read one paragraph in, I'd be thinking this is a bunch of garbage, because they don't treat the subject honestly from the very beginning. They don't deal with any kind of contrary information whatsoever, and they disguise their numbers, and they're inflating things all over the place by using these wild extrapolations without sufficient basis. It's ridiculous. The, the, the real problem to me that I'm trying to chronicle, if you will, because I feel like I've been kind of part of it with Skeptico, is how rapidly they've undermined science. You know what I mean? Because like yeah. you did the thing with Daryl Bem for your Journal of Scientific Exploration paper. I had Daryl Bem on this show. Let me pull it up. Hey, uh, Alex. Yes. While you're, while you're doing that, I want to mention two things because I want to say this and I'm hoping that it's you, you find it worth including. Number one, I love talking about how science is undermined. OK, and I also think you and your Skeptico program have done a lot to illustrate that. And I really admire that work that you've done. So to me, the hallmark of Skeptico is you're absolutely not afraid to deal directly with the people who disagree with you. And you, as far as I can tell, have honestly tried to find out if the other side might be right. You've asked them the questions you need to ask and you've listened to their answers and you've waited until you've done that before deciding, OK, wait a minute, this makes sense or it doesn't. To me, that's how this kind of inquiry should be conducted. And it, it is something that I don't see very often anymore, at least not in, in these kinds of subjects. That's nice of you to say. My concern is that in the 10 plus years that I've been doing this, it's kind of coming up on 15 pretty quick. I've definitely seen a shift. I definitely have seen a shift. And I want to talk about that with you because Ultimately, that's what this that's what this whole thing is really about is how far down on the path are we? Is this business as usual? To what extent can we should we try to stop this? When I back in the day when I really had no clue and I had Richard Wiseman and Rupert Sheldrick on there debating about 
dogs that know when their owners are coming home. And I don't know if anyone remembers this show way back then, but we I really, we really dug into those papers and it was kind of a seminal moment because we got, we got Richard Wiseman on and he finally had to admit, well, yeah, he wouldn't admit that he was being intentionally deceptive, which he was. And Sheldrick called him out on it, but he admitted, well, the data is the data. I can't really argue against Sheldrick's data. To me, at this point, that looks so refreshingly honest from a very dishonest guy, Richard Wiseman, that it's almost a, a marker of how far we've slipped. I pulled up uh, episode 170 with uh, Daryl Bem responds to parapsychology debunkers. And I also pulled up way back Skeptica 126, Andy Paquette claims 20 years of history with precognitive dreams. The reason they're linked is because you did lean on Daryl Bem because you had a complicated statistical problem. Again, you're super rigorous about the way you treat your data. And as such, you had data that you could really do statist real statistical analysis on it. And you had to you had to really come up with some novel ways to do that, and I'm sure it spun your head around. Daryl Bem, Cornell University, published in top journals, had the same problem. And it, when when we did the the when we did this episode on Daryl Bem, he comes to the same conclusion: intentionally deceptive. And again, it was Richard Wiseman. Who, I don't know Richard Wiseman. He was kind of the guy that they leaned on to go debunk this stuff back in the day. But again, it was intentionally deceptive, but not to the order of magnitude that we see here. This to me seems like a whole different ball game where you have, like you pointed out at the very beginning, you have a peer, you, you have a pre-release paper that hasn't even undergone peer review and you immediately have the media access to the washington post new york times live science all the other places to make out and make all these outrageous claims this is a new level that i haven't seen before and it just makes you wonder how far they've gone and just kind of completely undermining serious scientific debate serious scientific analysis on tough subjects on the stuff that just doesn't conform with what everyone already believes actually i've got a i'm just going to make a couple of comments on that because i i made a couple of observations i hadn't really thought of until you started talking about this um so when i started getting into um studying dreams right it was simply because i had evidence in front of me and although i didn't notice it my wife did she got me to look at it um, but at a certain point, I started listening to your shows, and it was interesting. I actually really enjoyed hearing the adverse comments, the, the people who, who disagreed with the parapsychology hypothesis, because it, by, by listening to them, I felt actually better about um, some of the other conclusions I, I had made, because they never made any sense. They very rarely justified what they were saying very well, and I could very easily see through their arguments. If I hadn't seen that, I might have always harbored a suspicion that maybe there was a, a fantastic nail in the coffin argument out there just waiting to shoot down the idea that I, I'm having dreams about the future, right? But because I actually saw these guys or heard them on your show, I was able to just, you know, realize that, that that probably isn't the case. But one thing that I I did feel at the time is that this is parapsychology. This is an inherently controversial topic. There are a lot of people who just on the basis of atheism alone aren't going to accept anything related to this. And then you're going to have people for religious reasons aren't going to accept it. Then there's this tiny sliver of people who are going to be open enough to actually pay attention to the data. And even the smaller sliver that are going to understand it and even smaller sliver that are going to have access to the right data. Okay. So I was looking at the the problem with skeptics and parapsychology is being linked to that subject matter. But after listening to you talk right now, I'm wondering if we're seeing dishonesty among scientists in parapsychology, why would we think it's any different among scientists anywhere else? Okay. And looking at what we're seeing right now makes me think it is impossible that these guys suddenly became dishonest in the last 18 months during the COVID pandemic. I think it's been going on and we just haven't noticed it because the subjects were inherently less controversial. In other words, why question it? Okay. 
with a subject that is inherently uh, controversial, parapsychology, and I think this is also a very interesting data point, parapsychologists have been essentially forced to use far more rigorous methods than are used anywhere else because they keep on defeating the arguments the skeptics throw their way, but to do it, they have to keep on coming up with new methods that are even more rigorous. And what has happened is they've essentially become almost, I, I hate to say it this way, like superheroes among scientists because the strength of the rigor that they're applying is much greater than what you see elsewhere. So what that implies to me, if we're seeing this high level of skepticism in this field with this level of rigor, okay, it's definitely happening everywhere else. That is to say the, the lies and obfuscations and so on. And nobody's looking at it very carefully because it's not very controversial. So, and then I, I start thinking about uh, climate change science and you know conversations I've had with a good friend of mine who's a high energy physicist and on the topic. And I'm thinking, you know what? This has been going on for a long time. There's a very high level of credulity, a low level of skepticism. And I'll tell you, I associate skepticism with the practice of genuine science, right? Be skeptical, look at the data, follow the data, come to conclusions that are based on the data, right? But what I'm seeing instead are people who are following whatever instinct they have, which may be a desire, and it may be something that is based on genuine investigatory perception. I don't know. But what it, but in this particular case, it looks like these guys wanted money from who? And they figured this is a way to do it because um, doing anything that's going to support mask mandates is going to get the money. Uh, that's the push right now. So just like jumping on uh, the railroads uh, back in the 1850s, um, this is like a gold rush for people who do research, do something that's going to support mask mandates. And, and that's even putting a potentially positive spin on it. We don't know if it's more diabolical than that, more evil than that. But I just wanted to throw in, a, a, add a little meat to the bones that you just laid out, because retracing that history of parapsychology is really useful. I, I remember way back in the day, one of the things that the parapsychologists really pioneered is, and Dean Radin can be credited with, with this, is a very uh, rigorous statistical look at the file drawer problem, both practically and statistically. And the file yeah. drawer problem, in case people don't know it, is because people, when they want to replicate an experiment, want a replication, they can be prone in some cases, either consciously or not totally consciously, to take a result that doesn't get the result they're looking for and put file it away and never publish it. And that sounds really bad, but it wouldn't be, you know, and particularly parapsychology points this out. You know, if you're doing a Zen card, hey, can you tell, you know, what card I'm holding here secretly? Hey, if it just flops, you just go, oh, forget it, you know, just put it away. So he had a really complicated but useful way that has been adopted by other people to for how to account for the file drawer problem. Another one is the experimenter effect. When they said, hey, we replicate this experiment as closely as we can and we get a different result and when we really sort it all out the only difference we can get is the experimenter is it possible that the beliefs and values on some level that we can't completely measure of the experimenter is making a difference these guys these parapsychologists apt actually pioneered this kind of work that has made its way into other branches of science for people who are willing to be truly open-minded and truly want to figure out what's going on. Yeah, I, you know, I was going to say something else, but now that you said that, <laughs> I'm just going to point one thing out because I had to deal with the file drawer problem myself. You know, if you look at my dream journal, I have uh, right now, it's not open on my screen right now, but it's somewhat in excess of 450, uh, what I would call veridical dreams, meaning I've checked them out, I've investigated them, I've got, I've got some kind of validation that these dreams related to something I couldn't have had normal knowledge of, right? Um, but that number has been relatively constant since I stopped actively looking for validation. So uh, as of 1991, that's how many there are. And then flash forward 20 years and it's maybe a, a couple dozen more because I only passively verify them now. That is to say, if, if something happens and I just can't avoid finding out that it's it's uh, it's valid, then I'll write it down. But I don't actively go out proactively and try to find validation. 
So um, you could look at this as either a proportion of 450 out of 800 dreams, which is a very high percentage of, of vertical dreams, uh, or you could look at it in the context of you know, the entire time I've been keeping the journal, which is 13,300 dreams, right? Much smaller percentage. But it's a misleading result because the fact is I haven't been checking all that time, right? So how do I deal with the file drawer problem, right? Well, I report how many are in the journal and when I stop checking them and how many have been checked within that time period. And I ignore the ones that were checked afterward. Um, so I'm able to deal with it, but I do deal with it. I have to think about it. And I think about it because of what you're just mentioning from Dean Raiden. Um, and I think it's an important issue. I, and this is like these guys who, who did this article on the, uh, on the mask study, they're so far from dealing with the, the uh, file drawer problem. It's embarrassing. Um, but the other thing you mentioned about this being like diabolical, I did want to talk about that. Okay. Because it's true. You, you can actually be kind of nice in the way you talk about uh, these various lies that are being promulgated on the, the people of this country and the world, actually. Uh, in this case, the people of Bangladesh, I guess. You know, maybe there's well-meaning people who, who have an idea and it, it doesn't work and they just don't want to admit it or they, they're not able to, to see it. But uh, when I look at studies like that, a spontaneous miscarriage study among pregnant women from the CDC, that looks intentional. That looks like they are promoting something that they know will cause miscarriages on purpose because to them, their goal of getting everyone vaccinated is more important than the health of these people. And that is diabolical because at that point, they are doing something that they know is going to cause death. I'm with you. Well, I think you make a great point. One thing I will say, I save it for later, that's fine. But I, I think it's actually a very important distinction between people choosing on their own to do something that carries risk and people being told they have to do something that carries risk. Because it, it's like if you tell everybody in the whole country you have to play Russian roulette, you're guaranteeing a certain number of deaths. If you leave it up to them themselves, not all those people are going to try. It's kind of like the coins flipped versus coins not flipped uh, uh, issue when you get to the Ryan studies. Um, I, I find this is, is a very, very interesting and very damning point when it comes to those mandates. Well, that kind of reminds me of a couple of points as we wrap this up that I, I wanted to, to mention that get buried in all this. One, right off the bat, when people think about masks, they've been kind of conditioned to get into this debate about whether masks work in a laboratory in terms of preventing the virus. And we've all seen the graphic on this. There's a mask and there's like this aerosol spray that's your photography, you know, know how they shoot it. And you see all this stuff coming towards the mask and it either gets in or gets out. I can't speak to the efficacy of those studies and I think they're all over the board. But what I, what I do think is it kind of misses the point because the point is public health policy. And in particular, the point is science and scientific confidence and whether public health policy should be based on science, which we all agree it should be. And to what extent does that science have to convince us in order for us to give up the rights that we normally think are our rights, at least in this country as Americans? Our default position is, hey, you can't make me do what I don't want to do if it isn't harming anyone else. So if I want to wear a mask or not wear a mask, it doesn't matter. It's my choice. So the question is, what kind of science, what degree of certainty would you need in order to have something that over overrides that, you know, and that's what we're really talking about here. So that science is not laboratory science that you we'd, we'd quickly get anyone to agree that what you'd have to do is go out and test it in the public and see if what you're what you're trying to implement as a public health policy, it really is effective. The other thing that I'd point out really quickly, because I'm kind of going on about this point, but I keep making it again and again is because whenever we've done that, we always get a null result. We always come back and say, masks don't seem to make a difference in the general public. We've never really seriously considered the adverse effects because we don't have to, because we're not forcing people to wear masks. We've never really seriously considered the adverse effects. When we do, when a couple of people have, and they say, hey, there's some pretty risky things that we might want to look into in terms of mask wearing. So that's all left out of the equation because you shouldn't be mandated because mask mandates aren't really supported in the science after all. 
Well, when I when I see this kind of stuff going on, and I, I anytime I I see something that doesn't really make sense to me like this, my first reaction is usually I need more information. I'm missing information on this, and I think this is one of those situations because the COVID pandemic reaction, based on the idea that COVID is super dangerous does not match the data we have on the actual danger posed by COVID. Therefore, it's unsupported. The wearing of masks is based on that, but that's not supported properly. And the masks aren't supported properly, thanks to all the studies showing us that they're not efficacious. And so the fact that we're being told to do this anyway, when the people who are asking us to do it have to know that it doesn't work, okay? And we actually know that. Dr. Anthony Fauci is on the record saying masks don't work. Actually, several other doctors who are promoting the use of masks are saying, essentially, it's a a placebo just to make people feel better. If that's what they're saying, then why are they attaching legal penalties to not wearing masks in Australia, for instance? Or actually, even in New York City, uh, not now, but uh, a number of months ago, they were actually giving people tickets for not wearing masks in certain places. So that kind of thing bothers me. But but one thing you mentioned made me think of something. There's a comic published in the 1940s. Um, this It's a Donald Duck comic with a story called The Golden Helmet. And the idea behind this story is that the golden helmet found in Labrador established the person as the owner of all of North America. Okay. And so th- it, it goes through a number of different people. You know, Donald Duck gets it, an evil museum curator gets it, all these other people get it. And they all say what they're going to do when they own North America. So the museum curator says, I'm going to make everybody go to museums every day of the week. And school is going to be all about going to museums, okay? Um, the, this evil lawyer says he's going to do all these evil things to take everybody's money, okay? Okay. And then when Donald gets it, he says, I'm going to charge people for the air they breathe, okay? A sigh can cost a nickel, a gasp, a dime, okay? But the point is that they've got this arbitrary designation of power that allows them to make everyone in the entire country do the same thing to their benefit. And no matter what it is, whether it's going to museums or being charged for the air you breathe, it's evil. And it's bad and it's unsupportable. So when I look at this and you ask me, so at what level do you think it's okay for them to take this control over you? I don't know that there is a level where I think that would be okay. I mean, you could have meteors hurtling from the sky and the public address system could be saying duck and cover. Okay. And I would still consider it my right, perhaps unwisely to stand out in front of a meteor. Okay. And not be arrested for it. Okay. Um, I'll give you another example. You know, I, I'm vegan, right? You get, you know, I'm vegan. Um, would you like it if I said you had to be vegan too? Because I had the golden helmet. I, I don't want that to happen. Why would I want to force you to do something you're not comfortable with? It doesn't make any sense. Um, and that's what the government now thinks they've got the power to do. I think, and it's not just our country. It's like all over the world. It's crazy. It's not about science. It's about compliance. Heard that the other day. I think it's a great one. Andy, what's coming up for you? We are, I should mention, we are going to do another show. I don't want to tell people what it's about, but it kind of piggybacks on this one because it's about following the science and where we might get if we follow the science and what that might get us into in the political and parapolitical arena. But that's all I'm going to say about it. But what else is going on with you? What are you working on? What's happening? You know, I want to answer that question, but I hate to tell you, I just had an idea to say something and I want to say it, okay? Fundamentally, science is about honesty. Science that is not honest is not science, period, okay? Because if you don't record what you're doing honestly, if you don't state your goals honestly, if you don't report what you did honestly, and if you don't honestly evaluate what you've got, you aren't doing science. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> so you're asking me what I'm doing. Well, I have to tell you, uh, thanks to the pandemic, all the things I planned on doing, I'm not doing, and I'm doing all sorts of other things instead. So I came here and I wanted to set myself up as a commercial photographer. And I was really looking forward to like uh, traveling around the country and doing portraits of prominent parapsychologists, maybe even you, if you uh, somehow became reachable way with the heck over on the East Coast. And I wanted to do portraits of athletes. This is all the stuff I wanted to do and I was set up to do. And I actually started doing. 
Um, but then COVID hit and all of a sudden it was inconvenient to be in the presence of other human beings. So studios were closed. I, you know, I, I couldn't get to models or uh, clients or anything. So one day while I was talking to someone about doing a photo shoot, uh, this guy turned out to be the publisher of a large uh, online publication. He said, boy, you, you sure sound articulate. Uh, I'll bet you'd be a good writer. Why don't you uh, write up some uh, samples for me? The next thing I knew, I'd written almost 100 articles for him and got paid for it. So now I'm officially a writer, I guess. Um, and then I was approached to do a couple of comic books. So I did that. So I've, I've done this. I, um, I also did do a few photo shoots, got paid for those. And my accountant is very confused. He's like, Andrew, what do I put down as your profession? <laughs> because you're doing these different things. And you're getting money from different sources. Um, and I just started becoming a columnist for Red Voice Media. Um, but what I'd really like to be doing, quite frankly, is getting back to my art. And also I'm doing some research on the topic we're going to be dealing with uh, next. Uh, but that's more of a hobby that I'm doing just for my own edification. And I've also um, been getting a, quite, a, quite a few contacts related to my dream research, which kind of surprises me. It all started about, uh, I think, two, three months ago when some, I think you recommended me to this lady who's an author who apparently has written a lot of books. Trish and Rob McGregor have collectively written 100 books. And Rob has, uh, he wrote all of the books for uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. He didn't write the original ones, but he wrote a whole yeah. series with, uh, okay. with George yeah, so Lucas okay. on that. So I didn't know who they were when I did the, the interview, but apparently they're well known enough that I started getting a lot more contacts to talk on other podcasts and so on. And I'm getting a lot of encouragement. Rob and too. Trish, I just have to interject. Rob and Trish are super duper well connected. And they told me after the interview that Andy might just be the most psychic person that they've ever spoken with. And I think what they meant, because... Trish is, is kind of tuned into the scientific kind of part of this, even though that's not really her background. But they were just blown away at the extent to which you've documented this carefully and meticulously. And I just thought that was interesting. He might be the most psychic person I've ever spoken with. Well, you know, something funny about that, talking about the, 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 the relative uh, percentage uh, in, uh, improvement that we were talking about with this case study here, I oftentimes kind of get so um, close to my data that I forget how unusual it is. So what'll happen is I'll go a few days without a dream that's particularly interesting and I'll think, oh, well, I guess that's gone. And then I'll have one, but by the time I do, it's it's been, you know, a couple of weeks. And so it's like, well, this is unusual now, this is rare. And But then when I look at it from a, a greater distance, I'm like, well, wait a minute. No, I actually had several hundred interesting ones that year. And when I compare that to other people, it actually is a lot but it, it's hard to remember that sometimes. What I see in you, Dr. Paquette, is someone who is constantly switching hats, like you said your account is saying. And I think you are totally open to challenging what that even means, what consciousness means, what precognition means. We have no clue what that means, right? And that's what I think your research points to. So the rigor with which you've taken on the real questions behind that is what I think really causes us to rethink what that even means. Because I think there's an important recalibrating that needs to go on for the term psychic. And I think that's what you're in the process of doing, because we need data. Otherwise, it's just one person's opinion. It, it, you've never been the sage on the stage kind of type to say, do it. You've always been like, like you just talked about, like, oops, there it goes again. What's happening there? You know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of funny. And I just I'm kind of embarrassed that it took so long for me to notice because actually I had some pretty significant events happen before I was paying attention and I let them go. I'm kind of disappointed with myself for having done so. But anyway, as far as uh, as that is concerned, I have to admit that after looking at it and making comparisons with other studies, I do have a lot of examples, more than a lot of others. In fact, actually, although at one time I was very impressed with Robert Monroe's uh, Journeys Out of the Body series of books, I look at them now and I think, number one, I actually have more examples than he does in those books. And of course, who knows how many he's got outside the books that he didn't, I mean, he, I'm sure he's got plenty, but. But the thing is, a lot of what I read in there comes across as conjecture as opposed to data-based. And that bothers me a lot 
But the other thing is, I think that uh, precognition or, and prophecy, and I, by the way, I do define the two differently. Precognition is simply a view of the future, and prophecy is when you are shown the future within the dream, okay? So it's, it implies another agent. That's but all that's I your mean, but, but that's your distinction, and I don't know that that would hold up to analysis. Maybe it would, but maybe it wouldn't you know i mean what is the the what, agency and how would we deconstruct that and what from what perspective are we looking at it you know we're looking at it where everything looks like agents maybe from another perspective it doesn't look that way i don't know i keep coming back to this thing that the little bit of evidence we have and i don't i'm not going to speak specifically to your evidence but i'm interested in what you think about your evidence suggests that we are definitely disadvantaged in our perspective, right? Because like people come back, people like you come back, I don't want to take that out, scratch that. People come back from a near death experience and they go, I knew everything down here. I only know this tiny little bit. People come back from an out of body experience. They go, I knew everything. No, I don't. So process that not as a story, process that as a, what is the pattern there? The pattern says that we are very prone to being deceived down here. It's just the makeup, too many things running through the brain or whatever the fuck it is. But that would, that would to me be one of the guideposts on all that conjecture about what prophecy and the distinction and spirit. It's like, first thing we know is, one, if consciousness is fundamental, all that shit looks like it doesn't matter. And then secondly, to the extent that it does matter, we would want to figure it out. We're in the worst possible place to figure that out. Yeah, well, the way I look at it, it's it's kind of like, you know, if you have to repair the intercontinental cable that, that you know, that goes on the ocean floor, right? You have to send divers down there with welding torches and they have to have these suits on that essentially, unless you've got radios or whatever, they can't hear anything and all they can see is what's directly in front of them. And they have they have no knowledge of what's outside the water, basically. And they just focus on that one task. And to me, that's what being born into a physical existence is like. So you, you can't really. And But the thing is, at the same time, you're in you're capable of doing something important even though you're cut off from all those other normal sources of information. So I think that what we do here is actually important in some way, even though we have stripped ourselves of other abilities. But anyway, as far as what I'm doing, I mean, I'm, I'm actually wanting to get back to normal. Let's just put it that way. I want to get back to normal. I'm writing right now. I'm drawing comics. I want to do photos, but I want stuff to get back to normal. I want to go back to not having to wonder what my neighbors are going to think of wearing masks and not wearing masks. I want to go back to just being able to say, hi, how are you? It's a beautiful day. And not worry about that stuff because this is just really distressing. Well, Andy, it's been great having you on. And uh, now I'm even more psyched to do this second show that we're going to do in a week or two. And and we'll, we'll bring that to people as well. So thanks again. No problem. Uh, it was great talking to you, Alex. Thanks again to Dr. Andy Paquette for joining me today on Skeptico. I usually tee up one question from these interviews, but today I have to tee up three questions in this kind of level thing that I do. Level one question is, do you think, as we claim, this study shows a null result? That's level one. Level two, is this study big lie propaganda, as I claimed in this interview? And question three, level three, who's behind this and are they evil? Let me know your thoughts. Skeptical Forum is one place. Email me, however you find me. Until next time, take care, and bye for now. <laughs>